it's a good start for an Easter Sunday morning, and the choir would like for you to join them as we stand to sing together the great Easter song, Christ the Lord is risen today. <laughs> Standing as we sing, please. still standing and the ladies will play again. Will you please turn around, greet, welcome, speak to those around you and tell them happy Easter. We're so glad to see you this morning. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, and you may be seated. <clears throat> My privilege, as always, to welcome you and to thank you for being here on this beautiful, beautiful Easter morning. Some, including our choir and some of our other folks, have been here since earlier to uh, lead us in worship, and we're glad you're here for this service this morning. For those who are visiting, we extend to you a very special word of welcome and greeting and trust that you will sense the presence of God in this place and the friendship that is here to welcome and to greet you. You'll notice that there are the little visitor's cards in the few racks, and if you provide the requested information, we'll be glad to add you to a mailing list that tells you everything that's going on and when the next thing is going to happen, whenever that's going to be. Thank you, thank you, thank you for being here. You'll notice the midweek opportunities that are there before us that apply to some. And then we take the opportunity, as always, to rejoice with those who have reason to rejoice by recognizing birthdays over here. Yes. Tracy Douglas. Had or has? Will have. It'll be the big one. <laughs> Is it the Social Security one or another one? <laughs> All right, over here. Yes, uh, Helen Hodges. <coughs> Did you have your hand up, Helen? Oh, no, I no, no, I don't have. <laughs> <laughs> you have a birthday, Helen. 
When, do you, when is it? 11. Do you reveal secrets? 85 years young. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Brother Terry. He has a happy birthday. Wonderful. Any others in the balcony? Yes. Uh, who does? Sharla. Stephanie, who is home for the weekend and uh, family and this coming Tuesday. Any others? Any others? Yes. Barbara sends her greetings. She's with family in Maryland. Choir? No. Anniversaries? Anywhere? No? No anniversaries? All right, sisters. So you got the whole family there this morning? Whole Wonderful. Where's the, Brock, you got the little one there? Oh, I see you now. Okay, all right, that's good. All right. We come to our prayer time. I'd like to call a couple of attention, uh, things to your attention. Ida May Sanders, who was in the hospital, is now at home, and she'll be home for a little while awaiting some other tests. John Penn is sitting here. We'll show up at Riverside tomorrow morning at... Nine o'clock, and he is going to leave an old knee with Dr. Spiegler and bring home a new one uh, sometime or another. This one is uh, our friend Clayton Costello is in MCV with lymphoma, and we want you to remember Clayton, who is um, very seriously ill. <coughs> there may be others. If so, please remember them as we join in prayer together. Father, we thank you for this day, a beautiful day here in the month of April as we begin a new month with Easter Sunday. And we thank you for the promise of your presence with us, and we sense that presence already today. And we continue now as we sing together, pray together, worship together, fellowship together in your name. We remember these whose names have specifically been mentioned. Thank you for those who have reached birthday milestones, and we pray that you will continue to bless and minister in that way. We pray for those with special need and ask that you be the great physician to minister in those cases. We pray for our country, for our missionaries across the globe, for our military, for all who serve and represent us in different ways, that we shall ever be mindful of our need for you and our dependence upon you. Bless us in this worship time today. We thank you for the service already experienced and look forward to what awaits us now. In the name of Jesus, we make our prayer. Amen. Amen. We continue to sing the Easter songs by standing as we sing together, He Lives.
share in giving this morning, Ronnie Hall will lead us in our prayer. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for this glorious day that you have provided for us, not only for the blue skies and the warmth of the sunshine, but Father, we thank you for your son who came and overcame death. <coughs> Father, we celebrate that empty tomb today and we lift you up and thank you and praise you and love you for all that you have done for us on your holy name. Father, we pray now as we enter into this part of the service that you will bless this gift, multiply it, may be used for the service of your life only. Bless the giver. Thank you, and you may be seated. <coughs> Most of you are aware that uh, on Easter Sunday we have the earlier service at 8.30, which allows everyone to attend uh, worship service on Easter, the ladies who work, or the folks who work in the child care and everything and everywhere. But the choir is here at 8.30. They've been here since 8 o'clock this morning, and they sang for us at 8.30, and they're still here. And I hope you appreciate the fact that they make the double effort along with our folks up there uh, in the technology department, but some people go the extra mile to make it possible for us to enjoy the blessings of Easter Sunday. And we're going to enjoy the blessings that the choir shares with us at this time as they sing for us the beautiful Easter song, In Christ Alone.
Thank you, thank, <clears throat> thank you, choir. As far as scripture reading <clears throat> on Easter Sunday, there are many possibilities and alternatives. I'm going to read some selected verses from the 11th chapter of John, which is the chapter containing the raising of Lazarus from the dead. John chapter 11. Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore the sister said to him, sent to him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of Man may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. So when Jesus came, he found that he'd already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away. And many of the Jews had joined the women around Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Now Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary was sitting in the house. Now Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give it to you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. These verses from John 11. I don't know if it's just me or not, but it seems to me that we live in a day and a time when people as never before are interested in death and what is usually called the after death experiences. In fact, some of you have read the books about those who said they died and went to heaven and saw this and heard this and uh, corresponded in this way or whatever. I'm not prepared to answer all the questions that anyone may have along that particular line, but I do think there are some assurances that we need to be sure of this morning. And one of them is this. Not one single one of us is going to escape death along the way. We may postpone it. It may be delayed by good medical care and that. But if the Lord tarries every single one of us in this room, at some time or another, we are going to come to the end of our journey. And so the question is not, am I going to die? Or what about what's going to happen then? The question that we need to answer in our own heart of hearts this morning is a very simple one. And the question is this, what will be my response when all of this comes my way. That being true, this being true about concern for death and the after death experiences, I'd like to talk to you this morning about a light in the valley of death. And you'll notice that's in quotation marks because it's a quote from a song which I will not reveal to you at this point. I'd like to save that until we come to the end of things this morning. But what I do want to do is to share with you words of encouragement and hope for every single one of us on this, the occasion of another Easter Sunday. And in order to do that, I would like to begin with the bad news that preceded the good news. And the bad news that some years ago there appeared on this earth, a man by the name of Jesus of Nazareth. At the age of 30, he began, he appeared on the banks of the Jordan River 
and requested baptism at the hands of John the baptizer. John baptized him. The Spirit of God came upon him at that moment. The anointing of God was upon him. And God the Father confirmed that Jesus indeed was his son, the Savior of the world. Jesus began to teach and to preach and to minister in the name of the Father. Along the way, the crowds gathered in support of him, but there were those who turned against him also along the way. As a result of that, his enemies had him arrested. He was tried before a religious tribunal, the Sanhedrin, and after that, the Roman authorities under Pontius Pilate and was condemned to, to death. As a part of that scene, you remember all of the things that went on, the beatings, the cat of nine tails, bearing his cross, the journey down the Via Dolorosa to Golgotha, the shape of a skull, the hill, and finally crucifixion on what we know as Good Friday. In all of this, we find that it was a very grave situation, a borrowed grave, a borrowed truth, a borrowed situation in it all. Jesus, the alleged Son of God and the Savior of the world, had come to an early death, and that was the end of the story. At least, it appeared to be so. He was placed in a borrowed grave, belonging to a man named Joseph of Arimathea, and was assisted in his burial by a friend named Nicodemus. There were some women who were concerned about the fact that Jesus had been crucified on what we know is Good Friday, but his body had not been anointed or prepared for burial because it had happened so quickly. So some women decided that they would get together and go to the tomb of Jesus and anoint, properly anoint his body for burial. This, of course, would have been on what we know today as Easter Sunday. As the women made their way through the early morning darkness, there was one concern uppermost in their minds. In those days when they buried people, they buried them in caves, and they used a large stone to seal the cave shut because additional bodies from time to time would be placed in the same cave. As the women made their way through the morning darkness, the one concern they had was this, how were they going to roll that stone away from the door of the cave? The interesting thing to me is this, though the women were concerned about that, that did not deter them from going to that grave. They were convinced, I'm sure, that somehow or another, they would get that stone rolled away. Upon arrival, you'll recall that that matter had already been taken care of. The stone was already rolled away. There was an angelic attendant who was there who <coughs> told the women that they need not be afraid or concerned because Jesus was not in that grave. Rather, he had been raised from the dead. They were told that they were to go and tell the disciples about what they had seen and heard. Obeying the instructions of the angelic attendant, they left in haste, they went to where the disciples were, they told them that they need not have fear because Jesus had been raised from the dead, that he was no longer in the grave where he had been placed three days before. Wanting to check things out, Peter and John ran out to where the grave was. They checked things out, and lo and behold, it was just as the women had said. The grave was empty. The Bible says, in fact, that when they looked inside the cave, that the linen cloths that had wrapped the body, in which they had wrapped the body, were still there, shaped like a body itself. As one of the writers pointed out, like a glove, where the hand had been removed from the glove and the shape of the glove was still there. They were told again by the angelic attendant 
that they were to go and tell the others about what they had seen and heard. And thus the beginning of the Easter story as we know it today, that Jesus, the crucified Lord, was now risen, he was now alive, and he had appeared to his disciples and would appear to others along the way. And this is still the great truth of Easter this morning. The flowers and the bonnets and the bunnies and all of that have a role and a place. But the important truth of Easter, my friend, is not these things. The important truth of Easter is that ours is risen Lord, that just as he arose from the grave over 2,000 years ago, he is alive even today to live in the hearts of those who believe in him. <coughs> the apostle Peter addressed this some 50 days later in his famous sermon on the day of Pentecost when he reminded his hearers that Jesus indeed was alive just as he had promised, just as he had said, and that he was very much alive and present in the world today in, at that time. My friend, that was good news then, and it's good news still, that ours is risen Lord. The Apostle Paul, who wrote some years later after Peter and the others, put all of his eggs in his Easter basket, so to speak, when he said that if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty, and your faith is also empty. But then he drove things home in verse 20 when he said, But now is Christ risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Summing things up in verse 57 <coughs> in the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians, Paul wrote these words, But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And as Gaither wrote it in his beautiful song, because he lives, we can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. And because he is alive today, then we can be a people of faith, a people of hope, a people with assurance that we need not walk the road of life alone. This was good news then, and it's good news today. The Easter story, my friend, is that the death for a child of God is not the end of the story. The good news is that those who know him and receive him into their hearts shall live with him throughout all of eternity. I said to begin with that uh, my sermon topic for the day was a light in the valley of, the sh uh, of death. There is a song in the songbook which every, most of you here this morning know. You've sung it from time to time, especially if you've ever attended a Baptist church. The first verse goes, what a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. I have light in my soul for which long I had sought since Jesus came into my heart. But in preparing today's sermon, I came across verse 3, which had been there ever since the song had been written. But I had simply, it had slipped, simply slipped my mind. And the third verse of that hymn reads in this manner. There is a light in the valley of death now for me since Jesus came into my heart. And the gates of the city beyond I could see since Jesus came into my heart. Hear me when I say it, my friend. For those of us who know risen Lord, there is a light in the valley of death a light that it has been there for over 2,000 years, a light that has not gone out, a light that will never go out because ours is risen Lord. This was brought home to me in a very special way when I read 
about a legend. A legend which could or not necessarily is true, but could be true. Early on in the history of Christianity, there was a man who was going to be killed for his faith in Jesus. They tied the man's hands together, marched him out to a pole where they were going to tie him to the pole and ignite the fire and burn him to death. Unbeknowing to him and to the men who were carrying out the execution, the friends of that man had gone out in the surrounding hillsides to hide and to witness the death of their dear friend. As they marched the man out to where he was going to be tied to the pole and burned alive, they asked him if he had any last words to say. The man said, yes, I do. And as loud as he could shout it, he shouted out, he is risen! Although had they had not received Q or anything else, the people out in the surrounding hillsides responded, he is risen indeed. And from that day until this, Christians the world over, in many places of the world, when they see one another, they say, he is risen. And the other person responds, he is risen indeed. Now, to prove to you that works, I'll give you the opportunity to participate in it. I'll say, he is risen. And your part is to say, he is risen. He is risen, he is risen indeed. That's mighty weak. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Balcony, he is risen. He is risen indeed. That is weak, I'm telling you. <coughs> he is risen. No, that's for them up there. I'm sorry. That's it. He is risen. Will some of you go up there and help them? I thought something. All right, we'll try it one more time. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. Amen. The hymn writer has expressed it for us in a wonderful, wonderful way. Gaither wrote it, I believe he did, didn't he, Rachel? Because he lives. Huh? He, he and his wife. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, then all fear is gone. We'll stand and sing it together as a concluding commitment, invitational, surrender him, whatever. But as a testimony and a witness to our faith in Jesus as Lord. Because he lives, we are people of faith and a people of hope. Amen. Amen. Let's stand as we sing it together, please. <laughs>
for being here today. And some of you have been here a long time. But thank you for being a part of this service this morning. I would remind you of two things. First, we'll be back next Sunday, same time, same station. Uh, we invite you to join us then. If you gave one of the Easter flowers, then the ladies would like for you to take that today, uh, if you would be so kind as to do so. And now we will close our service a little differently. So get ready. What is her name, Brock? Quinn. Huh? Penelope Quinn. Will you ask her to participate in this, please? <laughs> All right. I'll say that he is risen, and what are you going to say? All right, get ready now. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Balcony. He is risen. He is risen indeed. They getting better. All right. Choir. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Hey, they getting good. All together, everybody in here. <coughs> he is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. Amen. Happy Easter. Happy Easter. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.